picking ITC secondaries is one of the skills of playing in ITC tournaments, so today we're going to talk about just that. Hello and welcome back to Allspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So the ITC secondaries have recently been redone with their new Champions Missions pack, and they've made some numerous and welcome small tweaks to their secondary missions, and I honestly think that they're looking like they're in a much better state than they were before. I think the main aim of these secondary missions is to give each army multiple ways that they can prove that they're dominating the game, as well as provide some interesting tactical play and counterplay for fighting over these individual secondaries once both players have determined them. In this video we'll be going over every single ITC secondary, a general opinion as to whether or not it's typically going to be a good one to go for, and some of the situational things that might encourage you to pick it or not in each given game. You can of course somewhat build your army to deny multiple secondaries, and to be honest that's kind of an entire separate issue, so I think we'll cover that at a different time. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the secondaries are now split into two broad categories, there's Maneuver and there's Seek and Destroy. Maneuver's focused on being in certain areas of the board or being on certain objectives, and Seek and Destroy are based on killing enemy units for the most part. You have to pick one of each of these, meaning that you are at least going to need to have some element of both holding objectives and killing enemy units. Your third secondary can be a second one of either of these categories, or you can go for old school, their version of the standard Games Workshop secondaries. For each secondary you can score up to a maximum of 4 points, meaning that after the secondary missions you're going to get up to 12 points over the course of the game. This will be added to your primary mission score, which is basically out of 24 points and scoring the bonus point for each mission, which can get you up to another 6, giving you a total ITC score of up to 42. I think you can kind of have two philosophies with the secondaries. Firstly, if you're going into a match and fairly confident that you're going to win big, there are definitely easy secondaries that you can pick up that will pretty much guarantee your score if you do table the opponent. Likewise, there are some secondaries that might be a little bit easier if you think that you're going to get absolutely smashed in the matchup, and you're just trying to salvage as many points as you can get out of the game. Most of the time, the outcome is at least somewhat in dispute, so generally you're going to be wanting to get secondaries that are going to be achievable as you take apart the opponent's army and you score the primaries. So definitely the difficulty of the upcoming game is certainly a factor in which secondaries you pick. Let's go through them one by one now then. We'll start with Old School, where you get the points for getting first strike, so killing a unit first turn, slay the warlord, line breaker, so having a unit entirely in the opponent's deployment zone in the end of the last battle round, and also last strike, which is killing an enemy unit at the end of the last battle round, which will typically be turn 6 if your game goes to time. In all honesty, unless you're really struggling for another objective to go for, I'm not the biggest fan of old school. It's true, first strike is pretty easy to get, and line breaker certainly isn't too hard either, but slay the warlord is a bit more situational, you're pretty much only guaranteed it if you're winning the game quite heavily or where your opponent has a warlord that they can't hide or absolutely need to throw into your lines to try and do damage. Finally, last strike is a bit of a funny one, because it means that if you've already tabled your opponent, I don't believe that you can score last strike. As far as I can tell from reading the new rules, as far as I can tell you only get automatically awarded the kill and kill more primary points if you table your opponent's army. I don't think that you necessarily get it for secondaries, so if you do table your opponent's army too early, then I believe that you wouldn't get this, but please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. So it's not terrible, it's typically quite easy to earn at least 2 points from this, but a little bit more difficult to earn the other 2. So if you've got an objective that you think is going to be very likely to get all 4, then it's definitely worth going for that over old school. Let's move on to Seek and Destroy now, and the first is Headhunter. For this you get 1 victory point for every character that you kill, so naturally this is fairly matchup dependent. If your opponent has absolutely loads of characters, then it's likely to be a good shout. If they've only got 2 or 3 in the entire army, then obviously you're not going to be able to max it. Unless you've got tons and tons of snipers, you're typically not going to be able to target characters until you've broken through the enemy battle lines, which means that you're only likely to score very good points for this if you're winning quite heavily, or the opponent has absolutely loads of characters all over the board. It's also not quite as easy to get this on bigger units, where you might want to get Big Game Hunter instead. Say for example, killing Lehman Russ tank commanders, you have to choose either Headhunter or Big Head Game Hunter to score on that unit now. You can't overlap any of these Seek and Destroy secondaries on the same unit. So Headhunter is a good situational pick. If you have loads of snipers and they have loads of characters, then it's pretty much auto-include, but you basically have to envisage how the game will go, whether you're likely to get opportunities to kill the characters over the course of the game, or whether your opponent is likely to hide them out of line of sight, or play very conservatively to deny you the opportunity to kill them. Next up we have one of the new objectives, which is Born for Greatness. You choose one of your characters, 
and that character has to try and accomplish certain actions across the course of the game. These actions are kill an enemy character, kill an enemy non-character, deny a psychic power, hold an objective outside your deployment zone, perform a heroic intervention, and start a turn in the enemy deployment zone at the start of the battle round. Now this one's an interesting one. If your character has a good game, he could certainly achieve multiple ones of these, but bear in mind that you are putting all of your eggs in one basket. If that character gets killed, then you're not going to be able to score any further points for that secondary. The ideal character for this sounds like it's geared towards something like an excessively fighty demon prince, or maybe one of the demon primarchs if you can find a way to keep them alive, or perhaps even something like an imperial or chaos knight. I'd only be looking to take this if I had a character that was very fighty, and I could either keep hidden out of enemy line of sight and keep well protected for the most of the game, or have a very big, very fighty character like the ones that I just mentioned that could be stacked with enough buffs to make it incredibly hard to take out for the opponent to the extent where they're probably not going to bother. I'm not 100% certain, but I suspect that this one won't be taken quite as often as some of the other secondaries, as I guess it remains to be seen. Next up, we have Marked for Death. This is the one where you get to pick 4 units from your opponent's army that have a points cost of 120 points or more, and basically if you kill those units over the course of the game, then you get 1 victory point for each. Firstly, this is obviously going to matter what the units are in your opponent's army. Most armies are likely to have 4 of these type units, but some armies might not, particularly if they've got multiple small units. They're generally going to have to be ones that your opponent is going to need to throw forward to deal efficient damage to you. If you pick a unit that they can afford to keep in the backfield and keep safe from your army, then they're basically going to be able to deny that secondary. So ideally, if you do have multiple units available like this, you're going to be wanting to go for the ones that are the easiest to kill, or perhaps the ones that you want to kill first anyway, so you don't have to adapt your battle plans too much. Typically I'd say that this is a fairly good secondary, even if you happen to be losing the game, if you focus on destroying these units quite early, then you're likely to get a few of them at least. And if you do happen to be dominating the game and tabling your opponent, then it's pretty much guaranteed. So not a bad one in my mind, though you do have to weigh it up against the others. Next up we have Gangbusters, which is the one for taking out big, heavy, elite infantry and similar. Things like Space Marine Centurions and Aggressors are prime targets for this. Basically you'd have to cause 24 wounds on these type units over the course of the game. There can't be vehicles, swarms or monsters incidentally. So basically killing a full squad of 6 Space Marine Centurions would get you 4 points for Gangbusters here. Again, this one is very heavily opponent dependent. Centurions and aggressors are everywhere in the Space Marine meta at the moment, and this can often be a complete auto include if you're facing an army that includes a lot of them. If your opponent only has one big unit of these three wound models, be wary that they might choose to play cagey with them, and if they can keep them alive all game long, then they'll have basically instantly denied you four secondary points. So Gangbusters is heavily opponent dependent, but can be an auto include if you get matched up against the right army. Next up we have Big Game Hunter, which has been changed to be 10 wounds, cumulative damage against any vehicles, monsters or titanic models. This one is now very easy to do against the right army again. To be honest, more armies than not tend to have at least 40 wounds of vehicles or heavies on the table. In armies that are going for a lot of vehicle wounds on the table, it can be pretty much an auto-include, and it's particularly helpful that you can spread the wounds out between different vehicles and still get the points for this. And I do quite like the change that means that little vehicles like Venoms and Talos still give up some wounds for this, but they don't give up quite as much as the actual big vehicles with more wounds on. Again, this one's a very solid pick against the right army, and it should be very easy to do even if you are losing the game. If you're playing against, say, a guard tank line, then you only need to kill four out of the vehicles available on the table to max this secondary, which should be perfectly possible even if you're losing. Next up, you have Butcher's Bill, which is a go-to if you're facing an army with lots of little units. If you kill two or more enemy units in one turn, you score a point for the secondary. It does mean, however, that you can't max it very early in the game. You will have to keep on slogging away for an entire four turns at least to max it. And sometimes you might just have a very statistically abnormal turn, when maybe you kill 6 units one turn and then only 1 the next or something like that. So you need to keep things quite reliable to be able to max this early, provided your opponent has a decent amount of units and you're able to hang in the game for at least the first 3 turns, then it should be fairly easy to get the points on offer for this, but it might be quite hard to actually max it out if your army is getting heavily beaten by the start of turn 3. So good against some armies that are putting a bunch of small units on the board, but a pretty bad pick against others where they have very solid durable units that's going to be hard to remove. Finally, we have the updated rules for the Reaper objective, and this one's now very broad and all-encompassing, where if you kill 20 wounds of any infantry, swarm, biker or drone models, then it gives you 1 point. Once you've scored the wounds for the Reaper, that unit can't be used for any of the other secondaries, 
so it can have some overlap with things like Butcher's Bill or Gangbusters potentially. So you might find yourself in competition with those objectives if you are trying to take multiple ones of them. Again, this is fairly matchup specific, but it's quite good that you can pick this even if your opponent has a whole ton of durable heavy infantry, such as intercessors, efforts we've seen quite a bit recently. Provided you are slogging through a decent amount of them, you'd have a fair chance of maxing this towards the end of the game. In some armies, it's just going to be an absolute auto-include, so if you're facing something like 200 orcs, then this is going to be very easy. If the game's in any way close, you should at least be getting a couple of points with this one, provided you have the option to max it. And if you do happen to be winning, then it's pretty much a guarantee that you'll max it, provided it was going to be an opportunity in the first place. So overall, my favourite Seek and Destroy ones are probably the Reaper, Butcher's Bill, Big Game Hunter, and Gangbusters, although obviously all these are dependent on the exact opponent's army that you're playing. I'm a little bit more wary of Head Hunter just because of how your opponent does have the possibility to counter this with deployment and screening, but again if they are using lots of characters it's a good one. March for Death I sort of feel with the points the way they are might be a little bit harder to achieve than the other ones on average, particularly as you have to commit to the exact units that you want to destroy before the game, meaning that your opponent can play KG with a couple of them if they really want to, but it's certainly not a bad one either. The one I'm most wary of is Born for Greatness, because of the potential counters, most notably just killing the character that you nominate for it, but it performs in coming months. Let's move on to the manoeuvre objectives now. And we're starting with the one that I think is possibly the best, which is Recon. This one requires you to have one unit at least partially in each table quarter at the end of your turn. And provided you have some sort of presence in the middle of the board, this is really easy to do. For example, if you actually have a model on the centre of the board, then you can choose to count that model in any one table quarter. And usually if you have any sort of mid-table presence, it's usually going to be possible just to nose a couple of your units over the line into some of the other table quarters as well. Making it generally very easy to achieve, provided you have a reasonable number of units and you have some sort of presence in the middle of the board. This one's got slightly easier in the new incarnation of the rules, as you can also double up on the points. As from turn 2 onwards, if you have two units that satisfy these conditions in each quarter of the board, you get two points from that. If you're running a decent amount of units, again this really isn't the hardest to do. And I see a lot of people taking Recon as a secondary, whether their army is just incredibly mobile like a lot of Eldar are, or whether they're just a space marine list that's happy to bully its way to the centre of the table and make everyone stay away from them with brutal close range firepower and assault capability. Next up we have Behind Enemy Lines which gets you a point for having a unit wholly within the enemy deployment zone at the end of your turn. I don't like this one quite as much as Recon, but it's certainly very doable in some situations, particularly if you're fighting a very elite opponent that can't lock down their entire deployment zone and you're able to deep strike some chaff units out of line of sight a long way away from their army, or if you just have a few manoeuvrable expendable units that you can throw one of into the enemy deployment zone each turn. Again, you can double up on the scoring for this one, by if you throw three units into the enemy deployment zone, then you get two points instead of the one. It's certainly not a bad one for highly aggressive melee based armies, particularly if they're fighting an enemy army that wants to castle, as you might just well score this very incidentally, while just implementing your battle plan that you wanted to do in the first place. Next up we have ground control, this is the one where you get a point for every objective that you score at the end of the game which basically means that you're either banking on tabling your opponent, or if you have enough units to jump out at the last minute to take some objectives from under your opponent's noses. I'm not honestly the biggest fan of ground control, just because you're sort of gambling that you are going to be in a very strong position at the end of the game. I guess it's not a bad one if you have a very strong shooting list, you're fairly sure will take out your opponent's army by the end of the game, but you're going to have to castle for a few turns, so it means that you can score all the secondaries right at the end of the game, hopefully when the opponent's army is dead. The thing is, if you do heavily lose the game and get tabled, you're guaranteed to get zero points for this one, which isn't great compared with a lot of the other secondaries that you can score as you go along. And in terms of tiebreakers, it is good to be racking up the victory points, even if you don't win every single game, to at least do better in the tiebreakers between other opponents later on. So I can't say that ground control is my favourite, to be honest, it's sort of banking on winning the game quite heavily, in which case you're not really going to need the extra points. Next up we have King of the Hill. This one's scored for having two non-character, non-fortification units entirely within 9 inches of the centre of the board. Or if you have four such units, then you get two points, starting from the second battle round. Again, I'm not the hugest fan of this one, as it does mean that you have to maintain multiple units within the board centre for multiple turns in a row, and they're likely going to be putting themselves in a place where your opponent can focus a whole ton of guns on them. 
and this might not be very conducive to actually winning the game as a whole. Also, if you are the sort of army that's managed to bully your way to the centre of the board and forced your opponent to back right off, then it's very easy to score recon as we mentioned, because due to the way that table quarters work, if you have managed to take the centre of the board, we already said that that's very easy to get units just nosing into multiple table quarters. So in general, I'm a lot more of a fan of recon than this one as well. This one could be a good one if you have some very elite units such as Imperial Knights, where they might well be able to take the centre of the board and rain down some death on the opponents, while hopefully scoring this each turn. Next up we have another very powerful one which is Engineers. This one's a bit complex, you pick two non-character units, and then starting from the second battle round, they can be sat on an objective, and they score a victory point for each turn they sit on that objective, and don't do anything and don't make any attacks. Again, you can also get two points for this one if your second squad of engineers is all the way up on a objective somewhere in the midfield doing the exact same thing. I think that engineers is really quite a powerful one for powerful gunline shooting lists that like to castle, as it means provided you've got one durable troop unit or something that can sit somewhere on one of your home objectives, then it means that you can still score the points for manoeuvre while you just sit there and blast away at your opponent. If you are playing such a list, it might well be worth taking a couple of units that you think would be particularly good as engineers, either a big horde unit that's just going to be a massive pain to shift at a long distance, or something that's just abnormally durable, that is just not going to be worth your opponent's time shooting, and if they do shoot it, then they're probably going to lose the game of who's killing the most. It's certainly a very powerful one, this one, and probably one I should think about using more. Next up we have an interesting equivalent of engineers called sappers, which is kind of similar to engineers, but for units pushing up onto midfield objectives. Again, you nominate two units to be sappers, they have to be non-characters, non-flyers, non-fortifications, and basically if they get within three inches of an objective at the end of your turn, they can render that objective unscorable in terms of primaries and secondaries, but I believe that you can still score it yourself. Furthermore, if you do this for two objectives on turn two or later, then you can score two points in a turn in the same manner to multiple of the other manoeuvre objectives. The sappers can't do this if they made an attack in the same turn, so it reverts to being scorable again if your opponent charges the sappers, as they're forced to attack in close combat. I think this one's a bit of an interesting one, I could see it being potentially powerful, particularly for armies that have durable units that can start in the midfield or move up there very quickly. Again, it does seem like it's got the possibility of being potentially easily countered, by just removing your units that you're moving up to try and get these objectives. And it's certainly quite mission dependent. If you're only playing one of the missions that has three objectives, it's going to be far harder to do than if you have objectives all over the board. So I'd bear that in mind as well. Personally, I feel that Engineers is just a bit more reliable than Sappers at the moment, but I suspect that Sappers could work well with an experienced commander. Finally, we have a new and interesting objective called the Postman. This is one where you nominate a single non-vehicle, non-monster, non-titanic model in your army that can be a model inside a unit, and they become the postman. They can gather intelligence on an objective that they're within 3 inches, and if they do so then they gain a point. They can't do it again for the same objective, so they have to move on to another objective to do the same manoeuvre and gain another point. If they do it for all objectives, then they get maximum points automatically. Now this one can be quite good if you have a really fast moving character unit, and bonus points if they're durable as well. It's also better on the objective maps where you have a whole ton of objectives rather than just three of them, because it might be very hard for your postman person to get to the enemy held objective without getting killed on the way. I think it could be potentially useful, particularly if you have a very very rapid character such as a warlock on a jet bike that could quicken himself, or perhaps even an Astra Militarum company commander with move move move. I do sort of feel that this one will be quite easy to typically get two objectives on if you're playing on one of the maps with multiple objectives, but then you might start to struggle a bit after that, and they might wind up getting killed after making their third drop or something. So this one you're putting a lot of value in one model. It certainly could pay off big, but you could potentially lose out very early in the game if your opponent can engineer a way to kill them or deny them getting to one of the important objectives. So overall, from the manoeuvre secondaries, I think that recon and engineers are probably the two strongest picks although naturally it is going to depend on the exact army that you're playing and the matchup that you have. I feel that the others are just a little bit more situational and less reliable. In general though, I think in the vast majority of matchups, you should be able to find three secondaries between the maneuver and seek and destroy ones that you're going to be able to score with some reliability, even if you are playing a game that really isn't going your way. With my current Space Marine army, I've typically been going for two seek and destroy objectives, depending on the opponent's forces, and then thinking about either recon, engineers, or even the postman, depending on the mission. 
So I hope that's been of some use to you guys. If you've got any insights into how to utilise these secondaries to the best advantage in competitive tournament games, please let me know down in the comments. And also please correct me if I've made any errors with any of the secondaries, as there are quite a lot of rules to wade through, and some of these do have some quite subtle interpretations and meanings. I'll most certainly be continuing with other tournament-related content in the future, so if that interests you at all, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I think the next one we'll be going for will hopefully be a general discussion of trying to maximise our score in tournaments, so check back in a week or two if you'd like to see that. If you'd like to help out the channel at all, I do have a Patreon page that is linked in the description below. The Patreon is what allows me to focus on the channel as more of a full-time thing rather than part-time in weekends and evenings, so if you are enjoying a lot of the videos, then any support that you can give the channel is greatly appreciated. As always, a massive thank you to my current Patreons for helping make this possible. In any case, thank you very much for listening, I'll hope to see you guys next time.